scripture this morning. Our scripture this morning is from 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 31. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For, God, for, the, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the, the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth. But God shows what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God shows what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God shows what is low and despised in the world, even things that, that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being may boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for calling us to you, to be your children, for bringing us here together to worship you, the, the one true almighty God. We pray that you your wisdom would be would be preached here from your word that you would give Mark the words to, to communicate what, what you want us to hear. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, before we continue in um, 1 Corinthians, um, obviously there's some major events that happened in the world this week, uh, Monday, with the, uh, uh, the war starting between Hamas and uh, the Palestinians in, in Israel. Uh, we don't make a habit of talking politics from the front, uh, but, but I felt the need that we at least need to acknowledge something that we, ca- we so easily forget as the church. One, we hear things like what's going on right now in the Middle East, and we can become afraid, especially, especially if you're reading the news. It's, it's this fear of what's going to happen. And those are all, I think, true fears to a certain degree. And I think they're all right that we need to be aware of what's going on, not just in the world, but through our whole country and the craziness that's involved. But, but what I, I felt the need to do is to reiterate, to remind us as the church, as God's people, our hope is not found in the world. Our fear, our fear the world and the issues of the world, we are not afraid of those things. We do not desire lives taken. We do not desire wars. We don't, we don't look for it and go, yes, this is a good thing. Wars are horrible. Wars are horrible. But what's even worse is that over in the Middle East right now, there are millions of people who do not know Christ. They say, what can we do? At the, the, the government and the politicians and, and world leaders pray for them as they're striving to figure out what's the right thing to do and the right action to take and who do we support and what do we to condemn and who do we condemn, all those things. But as a church, we could talk about them, we could debate them, we can have conversations, but ultimately what we stand on is the sovereignty of God, knowing, you know what? God's got this in his hands. And that doesn't mean that then we just case or raw, live our life like nothing is going on, but instead to, to focus and to go, God, we trust you. And when the fear in my heart starts to rise up and I begin to forget not only who do I belong to, but, but who is the one who gives eternal life? 
Who should I really fear? I should fear the Lord. I should fear him and his glory and his honor. And so uh, I want to spend the next few moments and I'm going to pray for the situation, but I'm also going to pray for us as a church. And I, and I ask that throughout and until this ends, and we should probably do this actually every single day of our lives, is to remind ourselves that whether, whether we're dealing with hardship in our own lives and in our own home or looking at the world around us and seeing what's going on and it looks like chaos and all of a sudden the world's going to suddenly explode, we know that as God's people, the world will not end until Jesus comes. And when he comes, we're going to be with him. We have nothing to fear. We do not have to fear death. Christ has defeated death for us. But it's also our responsibility to point people to Christ. Especially in such difficult situations that can rise up so much fear in the hearts of people. So let's take the next few moments as I, as I lead us in prayer over this whole situation. Father, when we forget that you are the creator of the world, when we forget that you are sovereign over all things, there is nothing that is hidden from you. You know the depths of the hearts of men. You know, and in fact, you are already working all things for your good, even this situation. We pray, Father, that your name would be proclaimed in this situation. The the Palestinians, they need your son. Your people, Israel, need your son. They need to know you, Father. And so we ask that you would soften the hearts of your people. You would soften the hearts of even the people around us and this this world needs you and needs your son, Father. And so as your people, may we be the light. May we speak the truth of who you are and your gospel message of your son to a a dark and dying world, an unbelieving world that, that fears the future. Help us, Father, to live lives of peace that even when all things are pointing to the end, even when all things point to we should be fearful that we, we will lay all those burdens at your feet and we will tell people, my hope is not found in the things of this world, but in you. And so we can have peace. God, we ask that you would do your will in this situation. That you would speak that you would work all things so that your son may be known. God, we ask this in your name. Amen. All right, so 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 18 to 31, a little bit longer passage than what we're used to. Uh, But in the previous verses, 1 through 17, Paul uses his opening words to the church in Corinth to remind them of who they are and to recenter their focus. They had forgotten that they had been bought at a high price when Christ shed his blood upon the cross to redeem, redeem them from the wrath of God for their sinful rebellion against him. They had lost sight of the gospel message, focusing instead on the eloquent speech of those who had preached that same gospel. They were focused on the messenger, not the message. Because those who they said, I follow Apollos, I follow Paul, they were all preaching the gospel message. Divisions and quarrels that had nothing to do with the gospel had formed between the people. Preferences were taking precedent over the truths of God and in doing so, the church was emptying the cross of its power. Not that the power of the cross is ever truly emptied for those who believe, but the Corinthians were in a sense stripping the power of salvation from the cross and then placing it on the eloquence of the presentation of the gospel. I like the way that guy speaks. He, if you listen to Paul, then you truly will be saved. 
Well, if you listen to Christ, then you truly will be saved. They were placing the power of redemption and salvation in an individual, not the message. In essence, Paul is telling them that they're acting like an unbelieving world, which is why he speaks what he says in our uh, our passage this morning. He spends the first eight verses of this section comparing and contrasting the wisdom of this world with the wisdom of God. Two wisdoms that are utterly opposed to one another. And in case the church in Corinth didn't understand what Paul is trying to get at, he then uses them as a case study, which is just classic Paul. You don't get it? Oh, okay, well, let's examine you. Let's look at your life. His goal in this passage is to expose the church's foolishness and acting like um, the unbelieving world around them. And so, yes, his words are meant to cut deep so that they would turn from their current ways. They're still believers. They're still saved but they had lost their way. They had lost their focus. And so these are harsh words meant to cut deep, but they are also words of gentle correction and encouragement towards that church to recenter their way of thinking and acting to be in line with their true identity and worth. As he says at the beginning of his his letter, you are the church of God. You are his church people. He begins verses 18 and 19, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment or the understanding and the insights of the discerning, I will thwart. See, the word of the cross is the gospel message of salvation by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. That word is folly to those who are perishing, to those who are not saved from God's wrath for their sinful rebellion. But but to the Christian, to the believer, the gospel message is the power of God to save them. And again, these are two very different responses to the exact same message. How can there be such polar opposite reactions? Well, An unbelieving world rejects the work of Christ upon the cross because to them it is silly. It is stupid, if you want to put it a little bit more in modern language. It's unwise. Paul says just in the next chapter, chapter 2, verse 14, the natural person or the one who serves and is controlled by their sinful nature does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Those things are spiritually discerned or they're spiritually understood by those who serve and are controlled by the Holy Spirit. To an unbelieving world, the gospel message makes absolutely no sense. The cross is a stumbling block for Jews because how can one who is hung on a tree, who in the words of God himself is to be cursed because he was hung on a tree, how can that man who's cursed by God, be the Messiah of God's people. It doesn't make any sense. And it's stupid. It's a dumb thing for God to do. And so I won't believe. But for the Gentiles and the Greeks, that would be us. (laughs) The cross is foolishness. There is no wisdom in the cross of Christ. That was big to the Greeks. What is wisdom? In fact, they would go and debate each other endlessly just so that they can show how smart they are. Wisdom and knowledge were chief among the Greeks. But in the cross, there is no wisdom. Because would it be wise for God to use, wouldn't it be wise for God to use the educated, the powerful, and the influential of this world to accomplish his goal of salvation and not the death of a criminal on a cross? That's not going to do anything. That doesn't make any sense. You see, it's through the preaching and the hearing of the gospel message, though, that God changes the hearts of unbelievers to understand and believe the gospel. It is God's power that is at work in the cross. It is God's power that is at work in Paul when he preached Christ crucified. 
God opens the eyes of unbelievers so that they may understand and believe the gospel message through faith, not works. So it doesn't matter how fancy Sunday morning service is. It doesn't matter how professional the worship team is or how eloquent the speaker is, how hot or cold the room is temperature-wise. All of that is set aside. Because those things do not change hearts of men. The gospel does. You can sit and debate someone who's an unbeliever until you're blue in the face and then continue to debate them. But if they do not hear and understand and believe the gospel message, if they do not turn from their wicked ways, they will never believe. No matter how eloquent you are no matter how many answers you give that are correct, they will always find another. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, what about this? Because it is the gospel that changes hearts. It is God through the gospel that changes hearts. See, one of the most beautiful and powerful characteristics of God is that he does things differently from the world. Out of everyone in the world, out of all of the rulers and the kings and authorities, God chose an unknown pagan man to be the father of his people. And his name was Abraham. He was a nobody. And yet God chose him. He wasn't even a believer believer in Yahweh. And God met him, saved him, and made him the father of his people. Through Abraham's line of, uh, of descendants, a nation grew up. But it was far from the largest of nations. It was far from the most powerful nation. In fact, it was a nation who eventually became enslaved by the most powerful nation in the world at the time. And yet, God chose them to be his people. And throughout the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, he says over and over again that they were a nation... They were a nation that he brought up so that they might proclaim the greatness of his name to the nations of the earth. I did this so that nations may know me. And yet, God is the one who chose them to be his people. Many times God chose the second born instead of the first born, which was totally out of character for the culture of the time. He chose a young shepherd from the fields to be the king of his people in David. He chose a poor and in the world's eyes unremarkable couple to be the earthly parents of his son. He used the death of his son upon a cross to become the curse for his people, saving them from his wrath. You see, God has a habit of destroying and thwarting the world's wisdom and discernment by fulfilling his will through crazy, silly, and completely unexpected ways. What an unbelieving world misses is that, and what they don't understand, is that God is not a small God. He is not a God made in our image. And he is not subservient to the desires and the wisdom of his creation. Well, God, that doesn't make sense to me. Why would you do that? If you read Job, or you eventually get to Paul in Romans, the answer is, um, who are you again? Are you God? No, I am God. And so God will do as he pleases, whether it makes sense to you or not. What an unbelieving world does not see is that he is not weak and he is not foolish because the foolishness of God, quote unquote, the foolishness of God, so God on his dumbest days, which don't happen, by the way, but if you're thinking from a worldly position, God on his dumbest days and his most foolish of days is wiser than the wisest of men. And the weakness, quote unquote, of God is stronger than the strongest of men. And to drive the point home, again, Paul uses the Corinthians as his case study. 
Man, I, 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 I wish I could have met Paul. That would have been great, but he probably would have been like, let's look at your life, Mark. Um, no, let's go, go look over here. Let's, let's use him as a case study. But Paul doesn't do, he, he says, for consider your calling brothers in verse 26. So he's pointing back to them. Look, look at who you are. Let's take a deep look at you as a church. According to the worldly standards, not many of the Corinthians were wise, powerful, or of, no, or of noble birth. In fact, by the world's standards, they were foolish, weak, and of low social status. But what did God do? He says, he chose them. He chose the foolish in Corinth to shame the wise. He chose the weak in Corinth to shame the strong. He chose the low and despised in Corinth. He chose the things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, meaning that God chose the nobodies of Corinth to shame the somebodies. God chose the Corinthian believers precisely because they were not a people by whom the world would be impressed. Now, why would God do that? Well, thankfully, Paul answers us twice, actually, in this section. In verse 29, he says, so that, remember the connecting words? Why does he do this? So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. God chose a people in Corinth who, according to the world, had no reason to be chosen so that no human being would be able to glorify and praise themselves for how awesome they were at saving themselves. The Corinthians' salvation, their identity, and their worth were found in Christ and his work upon the cross, not in themselves and not in their good works. It was God who saved them. He says in verse 30, and because of him, you are in Christ. Because of him, you are in Christ. Not because you were so great and awesome, but because he is great and awesome. And because of him, you are in Christ who became for, uh, to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. What the world says is the right thing. What the world says is going to save you. Christ threw that upside down and God says, no, through my son is how you were saved. Through him, he is your wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And he did that so that should anyone boast in their salvation, they would boast in the Lord and his mighty work, not their own. A few weeks ago, if you remember, I quoted Jonathan Edwards, love the quote, you contributed nothing to your salvation except, except the sin that made it necessary. That, that brings home the idea of salvation is through Christ alone. What did I do to save myself? If you want to, let, let, I'll give an illustration. So maybe this, this will help. If you're still like, well, I don't quite mean I, what you mean by this. Okay, so imagine you're in a dark room. Like you can't see anything. You're all by yourself. It's an absolutely, completely dark room. No windows, no light shining everywhere, but you've got a flashlight and you pull that flashlight out and you turn it on, but it's not working. Like not even a little bit of light is coming out. Now what the world says is, and that flashlight is your works. You pulled it out. You did it. Look, the world says, wow, look at this room. <laughs> look how beautiful it is but they see nothing. Their eyes are blinded. They can't see the room around them. And so it is with us. So it was with the Corinthian church. Before God came, this is how they were. They had a flashlight and they were acting like they could see the room. Now that's foolishness, is it not? And then God came into the life of the Corinthians and God came into our life. If you're a believer and you're sitting here today and you're hearing this and you're a believer in Christ, God came into your life. He came into that room and he set up a giant spotlight. You know, like the one that they're, you know, is used to call Batman, like huge without the Batman sign, but a huge light, LED, like you can imagine you turn it on and you're completely blinded. And what does that light do to the room? 
It lights it up completely. There is no shadow in that room. It is completely covered in light. You see, God's people cannot boast in their broken flashlight. Because <laughs> that's where, if there's not even a little bit of light coming out of that. There's no tiny bit of good works that we could ever do to shine light on this room, to save us and to make the darkness flee. But in our own attempts to save ourselves, out of the spiritual darkness, we just run into walls and we think we're smart. We think we've got it all together. I'm good. And then God comes in and he brings his giant light in Jesus Christ. And it is so strong and it is so bright and it is so powerful. He is so strong and bright and powerful that the darkness in our lives flees. It's gone. And it reveals only the glorious power of Christ to save. That is the wisdom and the strength of God. Now, before we begin to think again, okay, so all I have to do is be obedient to God. Uh, no, that's legalism. <laughs> this whole passage right here, Paul is trying to get to them. The speaker of the message did not save you. And you're following that speaker did not save you. What that speaker did was speak the truth of the gospel message of Jesus Christ God opened your eyes. You believed. He saved you. What did you contribute to that? Just the sin that made it necessary. Just the sin. And what happened? God flipped that light on and whoo, the sin, the darkness disappeared. What makes me worthy of being called the child of God? This is what Paul's trying to get at here. What makes me worthy to be called a child of God? What makes us as a church to be called the church of God? What makes us worthy to have our sins forgiven and receive eternal life in the presence of our God? Well, our worthiness, our worthiness is not founded upon any earthly wisdom, any education or degree, any life experience, or any eloquent speech or teaching. Those are all good things. But that is not our worth. That is not what our worth falls upon. Our worthiness is not found in the military or economic power of the United States. It's not founded upon any athletic ability of us or the size of our bank accounts, whether they're small or large. Nothing, none of those things determine our worth. You see, God chose us. Consider your calling, brothers and sisters. We are the weak and the foolish of this world. That's not a bad thing. <laughs> that is not a bad thing. Don't, don't hear me that I'm insulting you. Because if you believe, you are foolish to the world. But he chose us, the foolish of this world, so that when we stand in his presence, we would give him all the glory and the praise and the honor. And we come on a Sunday morning even, and in a sense, as God's people, we were standing in his presence, worshiping him, saying, Father, to you all the glory and the praise and the honor. My preferences are laid aside. My failures and my sins, they're laid aside because guess what? You've already forgiven them. And how do I know that? You told me. And you have made me your child. You have made me your daughter. You have made me your son. Thank you. I did nothing. And yet you did everything. My worth is found in you. Our worth is found in his son, Jesus Christ. Because he is our greatest treasure. He is the wellspring and the source of eternal life of our souls. We are his because of him. That is the most freeing and enjoyable and joy-filled truth of Scripture. 
But for the wise of this world, for those who reject the wisdom of God as foolish, then hear these words, know this, what you see as weak and foolish is actually God's revealing of his great power and wisdom. The wisdom and the strength of this world cannot save you from the wrath of God. Forgiveness and salvation is given only to those who hear and believe the gospel message. And so, confess your sins. Confess your sins to the Lord. Repent. Turn away from your sinful rebellion to the one who is holy, glorious, forgiving, merciful, the giver of true and eternal peace. Do we want peace in the Middle East? Then they need to turn to Christ. Do we want peace in our own hearts and our own minds? I want something only Christ can give. That no matter the circumstances of today or tomorrow in the world or in our own lives, only then, only those who believe, who are saved by him, can say, no matter what happens, I will be filled with joy. Because my hope is not found in the things of this world but in Jesus Christ. In our weakness, the strength of God shines ever more clearly to us. And so we ask, I beg you, believe. Hear the truth and believe. And if you're a child of God and you're struggling with your identity, isn't that what our world, what is like really big in our world, isn't it? What I de- where, where do I belong? Where does my identity lie? Is it in my wealth? Is it in my sexuality? Is it in my family, my kids? Aria is wonderful. She better not be your identity because she's going to let you down. As we all know, our identity and our hope, all those things, Don't hear me the things of this world that there's no good in this world. There is, but none of it saves. And our hope and our identity, who we are, is not in what the world says. It's not in what your heart says. It's not in what your mind says you are. It is in Christ and in Christ alone. So when those temptations and those sins come up, we can look, look them directly in the eye and we can just say, you do not define me. You are a liar, and I follow the one who is truth himself. And he says, I am his, and no sin, past, present, or future, will be held against me. I am forgiven. That's who I am. Father, I pray that as your people, that we would strive to fight those temptations to see our identity as in ourselves or in this world or even the things of this world overwhelming us and the negativity or, or the temptations that, Father, you would, you would bring to mind and bring to our hearts the truth that it is you, it is in you and in your Son that we have our worth, that we have our identity that, God, we are nothing without you, but with you. Father, we are the, the wealthiest, the wisest, the most blessed people of this earth, not because of us, but because we have the greatest treasure in your son. May we be reminded of that. And I pray, Father, that, that those who hear this words, they are unbelievers, that you would cut them to the heart, you would soften them to your gospel message, that they would see who you are and the truth in your gospel that they would believe and help us as your people, Father, to patiently, mercifully, with joy and love, point those around us who don't know you to you and not us. Not in the eloquence of our words, not be able, being able to articulate the gospel in the most perfect, profound way, but just to preach the gospel. Because it is what changes hearts, Father. Do that through us, we ask in your name. Amen. Why don't you stand as we sing our final song together?